Hey everybody, it's Mr. Wagstaff. Cool stuff to talk about today. So today, uh, I really like this, this lesson. Uh, we're going to walk through how a bill becomes a law. Um, the reason I, I'm, I'm laughing about this is because it is absolutely ridiculous what has to happen for like an idea to become the law of the land. Uh, and how incredibly difficult and the amount of hoops you have to jump through in order to make a bill into a law. So let's go ahead and get started on that. All right. So there's a little uh, Schoolhouse Rock uh, uh, video. Uh, you know, I'm just a bill. I'm not going to sing it for you. Uh, but uh, that, that walks through the process here. So we're going to slow it down and I'm going to methodically walk you through. Uh, spoiler alert, it's 10 steps. All right. And that 10 steps is basically just the steps is broken down for, uh, for this lesson. Uh, I'm not going to mandate you recall how to do this. But I am wanting you to understand the complexities that go into getting a law passed, all right? So to start with, uh, there is a bill. Uh, this is our picture of bill. Uh, so uh, bill is just an idea for a lawyer. Like, hey, I think, I don't know, uh, let's uh, raise the, the driver's age from 16 years old to 17 years old. Just it, it, anything, anything random, all right? Uh, so that would be a bill. Uh, process uh, can ha start, that we're going to talk about, it can start either in House or the Senate. It doesn't have to start in one or the others, but it's going to go through the legislative branch. Article 1, the legislative branch, is going to go through the legislative branch. Uh, random caveat to that, if it's a tax bill, if it deals with money, it has to start in the House because that's the people's house. As we talked about, uh, originally the Senate was just picked by the state um, until the 17th Amendment. All right. Step one, you have this idea, and we're just gonna go for the duration here, that this bill is to uh, increase the minimum driving age from 16 years old to 17 year, years old across the entire country, all right? Uh, so step one, a House or Senate member writes the bill. So there's somebody that's out there like, you know what? Should increase the driving age to 17. And so there's an elected representative, but he's gonna have like a staff. So it's gonna be like somebody that works for him is actually going to write it out. Uh, then a Congress member, and we'll just say it's me. It was me. I'm, I'm Representative Wagstaff. Uh, introduces it into the House or the Senate. We're going to say I'm in the House of Representatives. I'm not adult enough to be a senator. Uh, I'll introduce it into the House, and it's given a, a number. It's like HR, which means House of Representatives number 5732-K. You know, it's, it'll have all types of different uh, uh, letters and numbers to it, but it'll have a unique number to it. Okay. Great. Create a bill, uh, put a number on it, cool. Step two, man, we're going smooth already. The bill is set to be reviewed or discussed by the appropriate committee. Man, committees, a lot of times it, this gets killed. Uh, uh, probably this is where my bill would die. If this was a real bill, this might be like, nah, there's too many benefits to have a 16 year old driver. So people got to work, you know, uh, all, all these other, there's all these other different situations. Like my constituents don't like it. Uh, so when you go to a committee, which is, is a small group of people, if you remember, uh, that basically look at a bill before it's even introduced in, in the Congress, uh, they take a look at it. And, and some things can happen here in the committee. Uh, uh, basically it can get pigeonholed where if they don't want to make me mad or somebody mad, they say, oh yeah, we'll get back to that. And they just set it over here. And they'll never look at it ever again. It's done, it's gone, it did, all right? Uh, then it dies. And that, when, when a bill just doesn't become law, it just dies. So there's a whole lot of ways you're a bill to die. So number one, you can get pigeonholed. Um, second one, uh, uh, it can get rejected immediately, then it dies, all right? Or the com committee can send it to another committee uh, which is a subcommittee, uh, which is like a, a lower level of them. And if they reject it or they pigeonhole it, it dies. If they like it and it comes back up, then the committee has to make a decision again. Basically, committees have incredible amount of power in deciding early on what even gets looked at, all right? Because uh, if it dies here, it's, it's, it's gone forever, all right? So uh, committees have an incredible amount of power, all right? and basically shaping laws and basically preventing laws from going through. So the question is, uh, based on this step, on step two, why do you think so many elected officials fight so hard to be on committees? Hmm. Could it have to do with the amount of power that you would have on those committees? Anyway, pause me, answer that, 
and then we're going to move on. All right, so we're moving on to step three. So say the committee says, you know what, absolutely, let's increase the minimum driving age to 17 years old. The committee will then send it to the appropriate subcommittees, uh, which basically lets it have like public hearings and kind of air it out and it, they, they kind of tease it and kind of see what the immediate response is going to be. Uh, so subcommittees hold private hearings on the bill and then experts like are the driving experts and, and, and these are, they will show up and give their opinions on it. The subcommittee can make changes to the bill at this point uh, based on, on the stuff they heard from the expert. Uh, after that, it's sent, sent back to the full committee. So it could die there in subcommittee, but when it goes back to the to committee, so after step two, back, back, to, back to the committee. But still, most representatives have not even seen this yet. Step four, the full committee gets the bill again and can make even more changes. So they're like, all right, so this expert said that it was uh, 17 is okay, but you have to increase the tire pressure on cars in order to make it safer or something. They can add something completely separate to it. Uh, they're like, you know what, we're gonna increase the price of eggs in Iowa. At this point, they can add whatever they want to this bill, all right? Then, all right, the committee votes. If you made it this far, hey, good on you. You get to this point and the, and the committee is going to vote uh, on whether or not it should leave the committee. If, uh, if the bill loses the vote, it dies, all right? If the committee approves the bill, congratulations, it goes on. So the vast majority of bills die in committee. The, the vast majority die in, in, in committee. Uh, they, 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 they never never get out. So whew, it has actually come out so the House or Senate Rules Committee then gets the bills, all right? So after it makes it out, out of that committee, it goes to a special committee called the Rules Committee. Um, so the Rules Committee basically decides, they basically, you know, it's like the referees of inside the House and the Senate. Um, are people going to debate on this? Are we just going to be like, hey, y'all want it or not, up or down? Are we going to debate it? Is it controversial? Um, if the Rules Committee is like, what is it? What are they doing? This is ridiculous. You know what? We're not, we're not even going to put this on the schedule for people to even talk about it. If you don't talk about it, can't vote on it. If they don't schedule it, they get talked about, it dies. Like, it went through all that stuff in the other committees. If, if, this, if the Rules Committee doesn't even put it on the, on the schedule to talk about, it dies. If a bill is then scheduled for debate, all right, then... The entire chamber means the whole House of Representatives or the whole Senate, whichever one it is, and, and this, not in my case, I've, let, let me stay consistent, we're in the House of Representatives. Uh, the entire chamber debates the bill and a vote is taken. All right, hooray. However, debating ain't, ain't an easy thing to, to happen. This is, this is where all the news gets involved and, and public opinion. So if you're trying to push it through, and obviously since it was my bill, trying to raise the uh, minimum driving age of 17, and say there's people who are really against it. You know, they weren't in these committees. They didn't know about all these different things that were taking place behind the scenes. Uh, they didn't even know anything about this, but all of a sudden we just present it one day and we're like, let's vote on it. If there's people that are adamantly against it, say some state has, I don't know, I'm making something up. 95% uh, of their population is 16 years old. Obviously, you're, then you would say the whole, you know, 95% of their population can't drive, which is, you know, make believe, but just go with me. So somebody will have some reason somewhere why they're really against it and it would really hurt their constituents. What they can do is filibuster. If they're against this bill, they could stand up and just start talking for hours and 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 hours. And hours. And I mean, they don't actually have to be talking about the bill. They could just be reading the, the encyclopedia or the phone book, which is the actual things that has happened before in filibusters. Um, they do this not because they, by wasting time, can actually get the bill thrown out, but they're bringing attention to it. Like the country's like, ooh, somebody's filibustering? What are they angry about? And then they basically, by bringing attention to them, by filibustering it, they can see if they can get other people on their side uh, around the country that thinks this is a bad bill. And then maybe some of the people that were voting for it now decide, man, this has really gotten unpopular. Let's, let's, let's back off. So the main power of a filibuster is the fact that you can turn public opinion against something 
if if you're the person that's filibustering, you feel strongly. If, if more people knew about what was happening right here, they they would pressure their representative to not vote for it. So filibusters are actually very uh, effective, mainly because it just brings public attention to something that otherwise might just pass, you know, w without a lot of public knowledge on it. Uh, but this in particular, uh, if I would have thought, felt my whole argument here, the filibuster only happens in the Senate because in the House of Representatives, which, which, which I am in, uh, in my figurative uh, story here, uh, we're usually, half of us are so crazy, we, we filibuster everything. Uh, so uh, in the Senate, uh, filibustering is a thing they can, with, with three-fifths member vote, uh, it used to be two-thirds, and it's three-fifths, uh, they can vote for cloture uh, and limit the debate on a bill basically like, all right, you know what, we're done arguing over this, let's just vote yes or no. So the question is, explain how a filibuster can be an effective strategy against the bill. All right, so pause me, answer that in complete sentences, and we'll move on. So there's three types of votes using Congress. It's not even simple on voting. Uh, so all right, let's finally vote on it, all right? Uh, there's a voice vote. So members at one time say yay or nay. Typically, if it's an overwhelming support, they'll just do this. Uh, a standing vote, rising to one's feet, can be valid, uh, counted as yay or nay. This keeps you know super loud people from Mr. Wags that's like having an advantage in yay or nay votes. Uh, and then the roll call vote. This is the one. Uh, this is used in the Senate. This is if it's a touchy uh, uh, subject, they want to make sure they know who's voting yes and no to things, or or if it's really close to, to get an accurate. Uh, a read here. So a roll is called and each member votes yay or nay. Uh, this is used in the Senate. Roll calls in the House are usually uh, recorded electronically like click click, you know, like uh, because there's 435 people in the House of Representatives as opposed to 100 people in the Senate. Uh, so let's say, so if the bill loses the vote, all right, even though I've I taken the whole filibuster thing that happens in the Senate, we're still going to pretend like we're in the House of Representatives. All right, uh, hope I'm not confusing you on that. If the bill loses, it's, it dies. If the bill passes this vote, hooray, it's a law. No, it's not, not even, not even remotely close. If the bill passes this vote, all right, and House Representatives are like, yes, we like this, all right, then, it moves on to the next step, which means if it originated in the House, in the House of Representatives, it then goes to the Senate. If it originated in the Senate, it then originates in the House. It starts all over, all over. It goes, so it's gonna leave the House of Representatives and go to the Senate. It's going to then go to committee in the Senate. If the Senate doesn't like it, trash, immediately. Uh, uh, they can pigeonhole it, they can just vote it down. Uh, if the bill fails to make it through any part of the process that it already went through in the House of Representatives, when it goes to the Senate, it has to do the entire process again. If it fails any part of that process, it's trashed. Um, so uh, <laughs> the question here is why do you think it's common for a bill passed in one house to immediately die in the other. Like, if the Senate passes things, why do you think it's very common? Because it really is. They, if the Senate passes something, it dies almost immediately when it gets the House of Representatives, or if the House of Representatives passes it, it, it almost immediately dies in the Senate. Well, I, I kind of help you out on this one. Because they're designed to be kind of very different entities. Uh, House of Representatives, 435 members, are supposed to be in a very small amount of, of constituents, people that they represent. Senators represent entire states. So they don't always view things the same way. That's very common. Uh, they have almost different personalities. So something that the House thinks is a good idea, uh, the Senate's like, no. Generally speaking, and, and I, you can give a thousand examples how this is not, you can't take this to the bank, but generally speaking, the Senate's kind of the adults. The House will pass like, everybody gets bubble gum, and the Senate's like, no. So, uh, but they're very different personalities. Um, the House will put out some more knee-jerk reactions sometimes, or at least try to bring them up to a vote in the House. Uh, the Senate is more structured, and so because they have different personalities, it's real common for something to pass one of these houses and then fail in the other one, all right? So, <laughs> step seven. 
Due to the fact that the committees and subcommittees can change a bill, bills that come out of the other house may be a little different than the first house. So, so I'll give you an example. Say it comes out of the House of Representatives and they say, all right, uh, the minimum driving age is 17 years old and it goes to the Senate. And the Senate looks at it and he says, all right, we actually think the minimum driving age should be 18 years old or 16 and a half or let's mandate everywhere is 16 years old because it's not necessarily like that depending on your state uh they could change it so the the senate could take what passed the house of representatives change it the senate could pass it but then because it's different than what the house of representatives passed they have to get back together and talk it out again uh, if there's a difference, uh, then a conference committee, uh, basically kind of the adults on both sides, uh, get together and basically decide, hey, I had some differences, you had some differences, let's see if we can iron these out. If they can't agree on a compromise between the two different versions of their bill, it dies. <laughs> if, if this is comical to you about how easy it is for a bill to die, it's, it's designed that way. Uh, if they can work out their bill, uh, their, uh, their differences, like, okay, 16 and a half, uh, years old is the minimum age. Everybody across the, the country, uh, has to be exactly the same. 16 and a half minimum age for driver's license. All right. They all, they all agree on it. Whew. All right. And everybody high fives. All right. We're, 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 we're agreed. And then it goes to step eight. After the conference committee is finished, you send it back to both the full house and the Senate. Both houses vote. The House of Representatives, all of it, has to vote on this final resolution. The Senate has to vote entirely on this final bill, this final resolution. If either one of them is like, nah, I don't like it, boom, it's dead. <laughs> if both of them are like, yes, we want this as a law, it gets passed by the legislative branch, hooray, it's a law, nope, nope. Still not a law. There's one big final step. It's sent to the president to be signed. So the president of the United States, after a law passes the House of Representatives and the Senate, it goes to his desk. If the president looks at this and says, cool, and he signs it, it is officially a law of the land. All right. Now, the Supreme Court can still challenge it, all right, because they can still say, no, this law Literally, the Constitution doesn't say you can make limits on whatever. They can interpret it however they want. But if the president signs it, it is a law. If the president doesn't sign it within 10 days, all right, and Congress is in session, it's automatic law. So if he doesn't do anything, but Congress is still, because Congress isn't always in session, like, like being in school, Congress isn't always in session. If he doesn't sign it and Congress is in session, automatic law. But... If he doesn't sign it into 10 days and say Congress on their schedule, they're on break. If he doesn't sign it into uh, law in 10 days, and it's, it's called a pocket veto, it means it does not become a law. This happens sometimes when it's a real touchy, uh, 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 something that, that, that could anger people one way or other. So what the president will do, will just not do anything if he knows Congress isn't in session and let it die. So he doesn't look like the bad guy that has to veto it. If he just says, absolutely not, I don't like this, whether he's like, I think it should be 16 or I think it should be 17 years old, or I think the state should decide, uh, whatever the president, if he vetoes it, rejects the bill, you're like, well, here it goes, it dies. Actually not. There is one final, if the president vetoes it, all right, there is one final chance. But the question here is, why do you think the president has the ability to veto a law after it went through all of those steps. What do you think that is? Well, I, I give you a hint on this one too. It has to do with checks and balances. After all this work the legislative branch did, they still have a check and balance with the executive branch. The executive branch, because he's the guy that has to uh, carry this out. Uh, so uh, he is a check and balance on the legislative branch. Each of these branches has a check and balance on each other. So, pause me here, answer that in, in complete sentences, and moving on. So, at this point, the president has vetoed a law that House and the Senate have both agreed on. What they can do is the House is sent back to the full House and Senate. They have to vote again. Now, 
When they voted the first time, it was just the majority rules on each one of these. After the president vetoes, they get one more shot of voting on it if they really want it, but it has to be a two-thirds majority. If two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate vote yes for it, it overrides the veto. This is actually very rare. This is a, uh, this is a big boy move by Congress when they override a veto. It's very, very, very rare for this to happen. Uh, because even if it had two-thirds uh, majority vote the first time, the president is going to have a lot of supporters in Congress, and they're like, ooh, he didn't like it. I want to vote no on it this time. It is very rare for a veto to be overridden. Uh, it does happen, um, but it, 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 is, it is a big deal when it does. Uh, so it is very uh, uh, difficult to override a veto, but it can happen. Um, so say the only way this could ever happen. So they could reject it and let it die, and then somebody else later on could start the entire process over and they could like bring it back to life in, in that way only. That's, that's really the only way it could be done. So the question here is, why do you think the Founding Fathers made so many steps in order to pass a law in the federal government? How easy is it to pass a law? It's not. You, you should be like, that's ridiculous. It's designed that way. They don't want the federal government all up in your business. So in order for the federal government to make a law that applies to everybody, everybody has to agree on it. This is a long process. It's a slow process. It's an intricate process. By doing so, you're verifying and, and validating the fact that this is something that the states want, that the people want, that the executive branch wants. So when a law gets passed in the United States, it has gone through all of these steps. And so many people had to say so in it that in theory, the idea of you want to make sure you have fair laws that are not an emotional reaction to something. So they specifically made this very complicated and a slow, painful process so that the government can't over-legislate the people. That, that, that was kind of the idea. So it's designed to be complicated. All right. So uh, answer that in complete sentences, and, and that's as far as we're going to get today. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, it's always ridiculous uh, we're talking about uh, how a bill becomes a law. All right, uh, cool stuff to talk about tomorrow. I'll see you guys tomorrow.